All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, episode of the PIB Speaker Series. We are here today with Svi Benson Tilson, who works at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. And Svi is going to be, Svi works on um, kind of foundational um, stuff to do with rational agency. And today uh, he's going to talk on creating the contexts needed to produce the concepts needed to understand minds. So uh, please take it away, Svi. Uh, thanks, Charles. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Svi Benson Tilson. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, so, um, yeah, thanks to Sam for conversations related to this stuff. Um, so, uh, I'm going to try to go really fast through the stuff I prepared because I'm uh, pretty interested in getting to Q&A, uh, but I probably will not actually end up going fast. Um, and feel free to try to interrupt with questions. Um, but I might not answer them immediately. Uh, so, Uh, as an outer frame for this talk, uh, basically what I'm trying to do is present a overarching methodological problem that I see in uh, AI alignment. Um, it's sort of hard to describe, so I'm going to try for the whole talk to point at parts of it. Um, if I try to summarize it, it's something like... Um, there's a large amount of difficulty in creating the context needed to produce the concepts needed to understand minds because minds are large and complicated. So they put um, many different demands on our concepts. And this means that our usual method of analyzing a few concepts at a time falls prey to uh, a problem where the relevance of any local analysis of a few concepts at a time, the relevance, the relevance of that local inquiry to the overall project of understanding minds um, is either cut off because we're too zoomed in, or else if we are trying to not be too zoomed in, the inquiry is much too, is much, is just difficult. There's, too high of a bandwidth that we're trying to um, push our questioning through. Like we're trying to question me too many concepts at once. Um, okay, so hopefully this will become more clear what I mean. Um, so just as a somewhat arbitrary starting point, uh, what are we trying to do? We're trying to understand minds. Um, we're trying to understand minds well enough that we could construct an artificial general intelligence that ends up having large effects on the world that we'd like. Um, so a natural next question is what determines the direction of the ultimate effect that a mind has on the world? Um, one random answer to this question that people sometimes give is what determines the effects of something, such as a mind? The particles determine the effects. Um, the mind is made of particles. Uh, everything that happens in the world is particles moving around according to the rules that govern particles moving around. The mind is made of particles, the mind is in the world. Um, therefore, the particles and the rules that govern particles determine the effects of the mind. Um, now, this is true, but it's just not helpful. And that's a little bit weird that it's both true and not helpful. It's, a tr it's true, it's a true answer to the question, what determines the effects of the mind? but it's somehow not helpful to what we were actually trying to do. We were trying to learn how to think about minds, learn to understand minds, so that we could build a mind that has effects we like. And this, somehow we got lost immediately. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the way we can tell 
that this, there's an answer um, to the question of what determines the effects of a mind. The answer, it's the particles. The way we can tell it's wrong is that it does not help us with what we are trying to do. Um, so uh, to zoom in just one more step um, and to use an analogy, uh, let's say hypothetically that I'm going skateboard snowboarding and I'm going to fall a lot. I would like to not fall a lot. Uh, what you know? What could you tell me that would help me not fall a lot? It's true that the particles in the snowboard and my feet and the snow determine what happens, but I cannot compute consequences of actions um, in terms of particles. There's too many particles. The computations are too complex, would take too much energy, and I don't know how to do them. Another problem is that actions are high level. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with, um, I'm not familiar with taking actions at a particle level. I don't, I never, um, my understanding of what I want and what I can do is not in terms of motions of particles. <clears throat> uh, and likewise, my understanding of what's going on in the world is in terms of where my legs are, where the snowboard is, where my weight is, not in terms of where a giant set of particles are. And fundamentally, um, what I'm even trying to do is not in terms of particles. You can kind of maybe translate what I want to do into particles. You could hypothetically, with a bunch of work, translate um, the set of positions of my body that involve me falling to the ground and landing on my butt into a large set of particle positions. Um, but this is not the native format. Um, and this is, it's sort of, it's at the very least, it should be a warning sign that, uh, that we're not, um, you, you know, carving things at, at the joints. Um, see. So uh, particles is, you know, it, everything is determined by particles is maybe a bit of a straw example, but um, uh, I think people do say it sometimes, and uh, other people say that other things determine um, the effects of the mind, uh, such as the gradient, the training data, the computations, um, which drives historically gained control. Um, sorry, I, I, I don't like giving talks where I can't see people's faces. Uh, I guess I want to check for questions. If anyone has any questions right now, you can put them in the chat. Uh, Yeah, you can also for... raise your hand and we can allow you to speak if you want to ask questions verbally. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess I want to encourage people to and raise lower your bar for interrupting with questions. Um, okay, so... Um, So that was, so I just talked about um, sort of one way to fail to address the question of what determines the ultimate effects of a mind. There's another way to fail to address the question of what determines the ultimate effects of a mind. Um, uh, we have these high level concepts that sort of feel like they are at least trying to be about the core of what determines the ultimate effects of a mind. Values, goals, choices, meta values, basins of attraction, um, process processes whereby one part or aspect of a mind critiques some other part or aspect or behavior of the mind, and then the critique. There's some criterion that judges the critique, and different parts or aspects of the mind gain or lose power or influence or something. Um, and these are all good concepts, but um, 
uh, we should notice that they also just they just don't tell us how to um, do what we're trying to do. Uh, they don't tell us how to design a mind or take a mind and to determine its ultimate effects on the world. Um, OK, cool. There's a question. Yeah, let's take the question. Hey, um, so just going to read this out for the group. So Matthias asks, what do you mean by ultimate effects of a mind as opposed to non-ultimate effects? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, to some extent, I actually want to re revise that, but I just didn't get a chance to think. Um, I do mean something by that that I endorse, but one a version that I don't endorse is sort of like what happens to the universe at the end of time or something. I don't endorse this. That's not what I'm trying to talk about. Um, I do, I do uh, like I certainly agree with most people that we want that um, what we're really trying to do involves some sort of ongoing relationship with, between the human and the AI uh, and human values change and or on some interpretations human values change and so um, uh, yeah it's, it's not I'm not trying to say that we're trying to lock something and the reason I say ultimate effect as opposed to just saying effects is that uh, sort of the whole point is that the whole point of making an AI is that we want to get like very impressive cognitive work out of the AI which in particular means to some significant extent, the AI is doing stuff that we don't understand, at least at first. Um, it's doing work for us. It's understanding stuff that we don't understand. Maybe it then explains it to us or something. Um, uh, but there's going to be stuff that the AI does that's creative with respect to us. Uh, and so we can't, if, I usually think of determining as being a kind of constraining, um, and so if we so we can't we don't want to determine all the we don't want to determine all the effects of the AI um, because in particular we would be sort of um, well at least there's a tension between determining all the effects or something about all the effects on the one hand and on the other hand having the AI be creative enough to do impressive cognitive work that would be helpful to us. Uh, so like how um, we can know that Kasparov will win the chess game, even though we don't know how he will win the chess game, what moves he will make. Uh, there's that like the ultimate effect is he wins. We don't know what the means are, what the intermediate effects are. Um, and we want to like steer the ultimate effect. Um, so sort of like intermediately ultimate. Uh, okay, I will move on. Okay, so this is the enthymemic gambit. The enthymemic gambit is an argument that goes like this. Step zero, Z is some feature of minds. It's a dimension in mind space. Step two, now just set Z to be however you like it to be. Step three, since you set Z to be how you like, the mind has been determined to have effects that you like. Um, the uh, hard to read step number one is suppose that Z wieldily determines the ultimate effects of the mind. Um, so yeah, an enthymeme is, an, is a is an argument that has a hidden premise. And it works, but it only works if the hidden premise is true. Um, so just to uh, assign values to the variable as a sort of example, um, and if you're not familiar with IXE, it's fine. Um, uh, IXC is, some, is a sort of um, some sort of expected utility maximizer. Uh, so step zero, IXC takes the action that maximizes the long-term expectation of, of 
its evaluation function on sense percept sequences. And then the hidden premise is suppose that the, evalu the evaluation function on sense percept sequences that IXE uses um, wieldily determines the ultimate effects of IXE. Um, step three, OK, so we can just set the evaluation function on sense perception, sense percept sequences, uh, and that, and thereby we can um, wieldily determine the effects of IXE. Um, and so one way that this fails is um, is that uh, well, the, the, the hidden assumption is false. It is not wieldy to write down sense percept sequences that correspond to us actually getting blueberries. There's a whole bunch of work you would have to do to go from what we mean by us getting blueberries to sense percept sequences such that if IXE um, optimizes, or, you know, searches for plans that will result in sense percept sequences that very much satisfy the blueberry predicate on sense percept sequences, then we will actually get blueberries. It's a lot of work to do that translation from us getting blueberries to sense percept sequences, which when maximized gets us blueberries. Um, and this is also an example of a shell game with um, uh, translating uh, basically like propagating judgments of what's good and bad out from values as they are expressed in our minds. But I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, okay, so we aren't saying, again, we don't understand minds. Um, we would like to understand minds well enough that we can see where we could see what we could change um, that would make mind that would make a mind end up having the effects we like. Um, oh my gosh, it's been twenty minutes. Okay, all right, all right I will try to go faster. Um, so yeah, what do we do? Uh, I don't know what to do, but I will say what not, I will say some things that I think we should not do. Um, so some things that we that some pitfalls in trying to get this understanding that we want to have of minds um, are slipping sideways out of reality, X supremacy, shell games, and philosophical wandering piecemeal thinking, and in general, the general thing is dropping criteria. So to foreshadow, by dropping criteria, what I mean is there's the overarching criterion of getting concepts, getting understanding of a mind that would allow you to uh, determine the, effect, the ultimate effects of the mind. That's the overarching criterion. This criterion flows out into lots of other criteria. Um, uh, as just one example, another criterion is that um, we like uh, we have to understand how a mind can be reflectively stable in some senses, um, refining exactly what in what senses and what we mean by reflectively stable is the whole thing. But uh, if your mind is just got if you make a mind, and you make it with some property that you like, and it has strong incentive to um, modify itself to, if it has strong incentive to modify itself, strong incentive to get rid of the property that you made it with, uh, then your property will not keep holding um, of the mind. Um, and there's lots of, um, there's lots of other criteria, but that's sort of trying to summarize the whole 
alignment field. Um, but uh, again, to, to, to try to finish this foreshadowing, um, the general thing here is that there is, a, there is this overarching criterion and many ways that, according to me, we fail to get on, our, get on the appropriate way with our inquiry into minds is that we get cut off from this criterion. Um, so hopefully I will flush this out. Um, so um, Uh, there's this thing in cognitive science called cognitive miserliness where, uh, at least conjecturally, there's like a general instinct, a general trend um, where humans or any creatures really um, will basically avoid cognitive expenditure of any kind if feasible, basically because Cognitive expenditure is expensive. Um, computing things like inference, inference time compute is metabolically expensive. It takes energy. Re reprogramming how you're thinking is also metabolically expensive and sort of like uses up resources, I, I presume. Um, like literally uses up neurons. Um, like you're allocating neurons to um, you're allocating neurons and you're allocating long axons um, uh, to inventing and implementing the new algorithms that you're in inventing for this task. Um, but you, if you could have avoided inventing new algorithms for this task at hand uh, and just used your pre-existing skills, you'd rather do that. So that's cognitive miserliness. Um, and uh, that's one possible explanation for a general phenomenon, which is that we just like to stick with our conceptual schemes. Um, uh, it's just a lot of work to uh, reprogram a whole bunch of your concepts for thinking about something. And the benefit is speculative. Um, Whereas the benefit of using your current concepts is very visible. Uh, and conjecture, this leads people sometimes to um, yeah, basically stick to their, their current conceptual scheme for thinking about things. Um, OK, so another way of dropping criteria is what I call in my head X supremacy. Uh, so a Bayesian supremacist um, might fail to notice that logical non-omniscience is a problem. Um, in other words, uh, a Bayesian supremacist, um, which to be clear is a straw Bayesian, not a real Bayesian, a straw Bayesian, aka a Bayesian supremacist, um, may fail to notice that Bayesian probability theory assumes that the reasoner um, knows all logical consequences of their own beliefs and fails to notice that it's actually a fundamental problem to cope with one's inability to compute the logical consequences of one's belief, beliefs. Um, uh, a reductionist supremacist um, uh, will fail to notice that their advice to me for snowboarding is not helpful um, because they're talking about particles and my values and beliefs and actions are not in terms of particles. Um, a subtlety supremacist um, will fail to understand. A subtlety supremacist is someone who um, uh, always wants to uh, inject nuance 
Um, uh, and I'm a great lover of nuance, but nevertheless, uh, reality can kill you. Um, and I've met subtlety supremacists who will inject nuance into this, um, which can be fine, but again, they can they are missing something very um, important. Uh, so other kinds of X supremacy would be physical um, physical supremacist uh, who wants all explanations to be in terms of physical or mechanistic phenomena, um, a neuron supremacist who um, who thinks that um, mental events, mental elements should have neural uh, correlates. Um, uh, computation supremacist, thermodynamic supremacist, etc. Um, now to be clear, um, well, I could do a lot of clarification, but uh, yeah, anyway, okay, so there's a question. Let's have a question. Uh, hey, so uh, Mesa was asking just for another example of this subtlety supremacy, just trying to um, understand what exactly that, that one means. Thanks. Um, if I tried to give it, I, I didn't think about this one super deeply, so I'm not totally sure it makes sense, but um, if I tried to name the general category there, it's sort of like um, uh, someone who notices that um, Someone who notices that people rely on con that people um, take their concepts about the world as like being just completely identical with the world, and therefore paper over reality or like fail to notice that their abstractions are leaky. Um, so the subtlety supremacist sees this happening, and then sees how impressed everyone is with them noticing with noticing that this is happening and goes one step further and says um, actually no concept ever applies to reality in some absolute way um, uh, no matter what's going on um, it doesn't like have to be really what's going on uh, uh, like, um, uh, like reality can't actually kill you. Um, uh, sorry, I guess I don't actually like. I've talked to people like this, but I don't feel like I can really pass the ITT. Um, I can't pass their ideological Turing test. Uh, I mean, basically, I mean, does two plus three equals equal five? Um, the simple answer is yes. A more subtle answer is well, it depends. Like, um, maybe you're in modular arithmetic, or maybe you're in some weird other algebraic structure, um, or maybe like you're talking about objects, and there's some like physical law that you're not aware of. Um, uh, but there is something that's absolute about three, 2 plus 3 equals 5, and the subtlety supremacist will not see that thing. Sorry, that's probably not a, good, a very good answer, but I'm going to move on. Uh, I'm happy to talk about this later. Uh, so in general, an X supremacist translates everything. Gosh, wow. Sorry, guys. I really don't like giving talks without being able to see people. Anyway, um, okay, so, okay, it's been half an hour. That's not so bad. All right. Um, so 
so yeah, the general pattern is an X supremacist translates everything into into terms of X X-ish stuff. Um, uh, every every question, every explanation, every answer, every concept is beholden to X X type criteria, and is not beholden to other criteria. Um, so, for example, a physicalist supremacist uh, will if you introduce a concept, um, like a belief, like belief, that's a concept, or goal, that's a concept, um, they will require that this be a physical thing, like a chunk of brain matter or something, um, and that you describe the physical interactions between this chunk of brain matter and other chunks of brain matter. Um, and if you do this, then you have a good explanation, or at least an admissible hypothesis. If you don't do this, you don't have a good explanation. You don't have an admissible hypothesis. Um, uh, and this is bad. And if you want to know more about why, you can ask. Uh, OK, so I think I want to mostly skip through this one because I've talked about it elsewhere. Um, but in short, um, shell games uh, are about um, sweeping things under the rug. Uh, sort of like if there's confusion or something you have to deal with that's messy, um, then you construct a scheme. You construct your AI alignment scheme. You have a few different parts. Um, and you set up the parts so that when I look at one part, and I'm like, OK, is this is this addressing that confusion or that messy task you had to do? Does this part address that? Um, uh, no, it doesn't. But it's but it's kind of maybe it's fine because the, maybe the other parts do it, or maybe like the whole all the parts working together do it. Um, uh, and then I go to this one, and I'm like, does this one do it? No. But maybe it's fine because the other ones do it. But I look at all of them together, none of them do it. Uh, uh, all right, well, I'm not explaining this very well, but we can uh, come back to that. Um, Okay, this is the this is one I really want to talk about. So um, yeah, so a core thing that I want to try to communicate here uh, is that there's potentially a, a serious methodological problem uh, that we don't know how to deal with. Maybe humanity doesn't know how to deal with. Um, the methodological problem is this. Um, when we investigate things, we uh, generally are um, Sort of attempting to modify a few concepts at a time. Uh, we will, for example, we will pick one phenomenon um, and then stare at that phenomenon um, and stare at it until we get one or two. Um, oh, wait, is that a. I'm seeing a chat. Is that, that's not addressed at me. Yeah, sorry, not addressed to you. Sorry. To... Okay. You're good. Okay, so um, we look at a phenomenon, we stare at it, uh, we get a few conceptual hooks into it. Um, we play with those few conceptual hooks. Um, we try to amplify them. We try to use them to predict, find where they fail to predict, 
or use them to design, find out where they fail to make a good design, tweak them, um, work them out until they're pretty good. And then we move on to a few more concepts to um, expand the range of what we can predict. There's an edge of what we can predict or design or do. Um, and the edge is a few concepts that uh, so there's a coup against the host. What's going on? Uh, Sorry, I was just announcing that we will switch to a more conversational format uh, where you can see each other once the presentation's over. Just just to let people know as people were uh, oh, okay. to see each other. We'll, we'll switch to that later on. Sorry to interrupt you. My fault for getting distracted. Anyway, so yeah, I'll try to go fast. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so there's um, so we can make a few changes at a time. Um, and this works pretty well. Uh, or at least it works pretty well for the things that it works for. Um, whatever progress we've made, I think, looks something like this. Um, we do have a fair amount of bandwidth as well, but this is um, mostly coming from the fact that there's lots of different humans, and each human is doing a few concepts at a time, and you have lots of humans doing this. And if you have lots of humans doing this in one domain, then you get um, some amount of conceptual bandwidth, bandwidth of conceptual change and exploration. Um, uh, but so the methodological problem I'm trying to point at is that um, there's no there's no good reason to expect in general that our conceptual bandwidth the bandwidth um, of how much, how many concepts we can be tweaking, refactoring, exploring at one time. There's no reason to expect our conceptual bandwidth is high enough, large enough. Um, um, it's perfectly conceivable that uh, the landscape of possible conceptual schemes um, has a sort of mountain range around our current position, um, where the only way to cross over the mountain range and get outside of its boundary um, is to change many concepts at once. Uh, that's the problem I'm trying to point out. Uh, now, why, why would I think that this is, um, I think this is especially bad for our field, for alignment, really for understanding minds in general, but especially for alignment. Um, so Indra is now the story uh, from mythology. Um, uh, there's um, an infinite field of per of, um, of beads of of jewels, smooth reflective jewels, um, space distributed in space. And the smooth, each reflective jewel reflects the whole array of all the rest of the reflective jewels hanging distributed in space. And if you look at the reflection in one of the jewels, if you look at its reflection of another jewel, that other jewel, its reflections, uh, also appear in 
the reflection of the first jewel, uh, and so on. So every jewel is reflected in every other jewel. Every jewel's re reflections are reflected in every other jewel, and so on. Um, so this is, in this context, uh, this is a metaphor for uh, uh, the way that um, minds, minds are the most complicated objects in the universe. They make everything relevant to everything else. Um, and the way and the way that they give relevance to things involves the whole mind, or involves much of the mind. Um, when you interpret things going on, um, you're integrating a large amount of information, uh, understanding, um, relevance, or implication for action. Uh, and so to, under, to understand an apple is not necessarily so hard. To understand what's going on with a mind understanding an apple is very hard because a large amount of the mind is involved in understanding the apple. Or the, the, the fullness of, what's, of the meaning of an apple to me, it just involves a lot of me. Um, so this means that investigating one part, one aspect, one feature, one component, um, one tendency of a mind, um, if you try to understand the meaning of that component or aspect or feature or tendency, if you try to understand the meaning of that mental element, how it fits into the functioning of the mind, um, how it gives relevance for future action to mental activities or to interactions of the mind with the world or whatever, if you want to understand the mental element and if you want to understand its how it relates, how the mind uses it, or how it relates to the mind, you're led in your questioning to question many other things in the mind. Uh, and this is a huge problem. Mental elements are Indra's now. They, re they, they reflect each other. They reflect each other's reflections of each other. Um, they, they demand a, a, a mental element demands, investigating a mental element demands much more conceptual, much more bandwidth for conceptual exploration and change than it seems, because it's not just the one element. There's the whole context. There's the whole mental context for that element um, that you have to investigate, if you want to, even if you only wanted to investigate that one element. Um, Uh, and this and this problem compounds. Um, if you really if you want to properly investigate one mental element, then um, you have to ask its context. What what does this mental element mean? What does this mental element do? What should this mental element be? And also, how should I understand it? In in my mind, there's a con I have a current understanding of some mental element. Um, my current understanding is inadequate, so I have to ask my concept of this mental element. I have to ask my, under my concept, what should you be? To ask my concept, what should you be? I have to ask the mental context in my mind of this concept, what did you want from this concept? Um, and that tells me what this concept should be, or what it should do, or what I should be able to do with it, what I should be able to predict using it, what I should be able to design using it, what imp what logical implications it should have, etc. Um, so I want to investigate my understanding of something. I want I want to improve my understanding of something that points me to the the context of my understanding of of that thing. Um, but again, minds are Indra's net. So when I start with one concept and then try to go out to the, ment to the mental 
context of that element. Um, the mental context, my mental context, my understanding of that thing, um, the mental context of my understanding of something, uh, the context is also insufficient. It's inadequate. It doesn't really, it doesn't, it doesn't tell me very well how to change this concept. Um, it's not well factored. It's not um, parsed out. Uh, it, it doesn't expose, it doesn't um, make explicit or handily expose um, the criteria that the, that it places on my, my some particular piece of my understanding. I have to investigate the context. I have to investigate related concepts. Um, and so this questioning is infectious. Uh, yeah, so um, so I know this is sort of a, I know this has been sort of abstract. Uh, there's some there's, I walk through some partial examples in the blog post associated with this talk. Um, I'm close to finished with my slides, but yeah, let's take a question. Hey, so uh, this is just, I think, kind of a clarificatory question from Mesa, which is, uh, can you give us an example of what exactly you mean by a mental element? Uh, is it an abstraction, like a goal, or is it something, a felt sense-like, such as the thing that I notice, the aesthetics of a MacBook? And to Mesa, they seem like different things, but maybe you're referring to either, or maybe you're referring to both. Um, it's a good, yeah, good question. Um... I have a blog post describing this, but it's extremely vague. It's extremely vague. Um, when, I, when I'm saying mental element, I'm trying to be extremely vague. Um, uh, like, I really mean like anything we use to understand the mind. Like, um, here are some classes of examples. Here are some like subclasses of what I'm calling mental elements. Concepts, values, goals, features, um, components, uh, uh, tendencies, um, basins of attraction, uh, memories, feelings, um, preferences, whatever, all that stuff. Uh, like it's extremely vague, but the reason I, I just have, I'm just using this word so that I can talk in great generality. Like I make I make a bunch of statements, I say a bunch of propositions using the word element, um, and I actually do want to be this general, um, and that might that makes my statements stronger, and therefore more likely to be false. So you can so more so I, I welcome you know critiques based on like well, but these mental elements don't. The, the statement you made about mental elements in general does not apply to all of this stuff in mind. So you have to be more precise. That would be a good critique or whatever. Uh, yeah, next question. Yeah, the next one was um, from Matthias. And uh, so Matthias says, um, when, you're th when you're mentioning piecemeal thinking, uh, I expected something like, uh, for every aspect of the problem, we have some way of thinking about that aspect but we fail to notice that they are very awkward to compose, perhaps even mutually incompatible or contradictory. Um, do you think that that's how, um, is, is sort of Matthias's guess of what you were hitting at there uh, the same as what you are saying about piecemeal thinking or are you saying something slightly different to that? Maybe it's a little, do you, do you have a sense of where Matthias is pushing with that or shall I try to reinterpret? Well, it was a bit of a short, statement that um, Mateusz made. Um, yeah, uh, well, we, we can also leave that for a but, discussion later, if you'd like. I, I think I think it was, plausibly, it was basically the same thing I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, what I've actually been talking about is sort of like, I haven't exactly been talking about peace and thinking. I think what um, Mateusz said 
is sort of more exactly what piecemeal thinking is. And what I've been saying is sort of like what what the thinking is trying to be what what happens when you try to not do piecemeal thinking? Is you get infectious questioning and you come up against Indra's net. Got you. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, well, okay, this is supposed to be an illustration of, yeah, like someone's like, we talk about aligning an AI with human values, but human values change, so we're aligning the AI with a moving target. Um, and then I respond with, what do you mean by values? Here's like 10 things that you could mean by values, different meanings of different interpretations of the word values, gives different truth values to the statement that you made. Also, I'm not clear on like what you're trying, like, are you trying to analyze one of these concepts of values? Um, like there's multiple good reasons. There's multiple different criteria or mental, con there's multiple different mental contexts that demand something like a value, a concept of values. Um, and some of these different mental contexts that ask for a concept of values are trying to ask for the same concept. Some of them are not. Um, it, it's, a, it's a big mess, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, OK, so we talked a little bit about slipping sideways out of reality, about X supremacy, about shell games, and about piecemeal thinking. Um, and the general thing is dropping criteria. So like I said towards the beginning, um, there's the general criterion is that we are trying to figure out how to arrange our thinking so that we're able to determine the ultimate effect of the mind. Um, this criterion wants to flow through many pathways to many different elements of our understanding of minds. Minds are big and complicated and, and entangled. <coughs> um, minds are big and complicated and interentangled within themselves. So our understanding of minds um, uh, is, well, it's, it's tough to understand minds because uh, because stuff is so entangled. And this means that the criterion of understanding minds well enough to um, get them to do what we like, uh, this criterion flows through many channels. It flows through many different entangled mental elements that we're trying to understand. Um, so to, one way of summarizing this is that the criterion has to flow, the, criteria, the overarching criterion for understanding minds has to flow through uh, many propositions, many concepts. Um, uh, so this is a summary. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, okay, that's the end of the talk. Sorry it went really long. Um, thanks for your attention. I mean, not sorry, thank you for your attention. Uh, let's go to questions. <laughs>